so today we're Today we are here because of artist Michael Muller's solo exhibition, Three Biographical Attempts at Gallery du Monde in Hong Kong. And at this exhibition is in three chapter, which are chapter one, structure, feeling, and accuracy, on view last September to November. And chapter two, the cloud severe, on view last September to this January. And also the final chapter, which is chapter four, self-creation, on view at the moment, I'll be, uh, view until uh, April 9th. So this exhibition series, uh, or I can call it exhibition mini marathon, is like Michael's personal diary from the past three decades. So through each chapter, Michael unveils his journey um, of self-discovery, enhancing change, and also self-formation. So in the, 50, uh, in the following 15 minutes or so, we are going to delve deep into the exhibition planning and also the practice of Michael uh, with the artist himself um, and also with the renowned Hong Kong based um, curator in Kwok. So we will have a Q&A session at the end and we will open the floor um, for questions from our audience. But if you have any questions during the, whole, the program, just feel free to type them in the chat box and our speakers will address them if time allows. So now please allow me to introduce uh, our two speakers today. We have Michael Muller joining um, us from his studio in Germany at the moment. Michael Muller is an artist with a German Indian background. He continuously broadens the methods of his artistic expression, combining works on paper with painting, text-based work, sculpture, sound object, music, and performance. And we have curator In Kwok, who is joining us uh, from Hong Kong today. In Kwok is the senior curator for heritage and digital at Daegun Center for Heritage and Arts in Hong Kong. She has been working as independent curator between 2013 to 2021, and curators such as the Hong Kong Pavilion at the 59th, uh, 57th Venice Biennial, among other many contemporary art projects. So without further ado, let's start today's talk. As we all know, this exhibition by Michael is divided it, uh, into three different chapters. And this is a very ambitious project. I also added the footnotes um, of every exhibition title um, added by Michael. So um, I would like to throw my first questions to our artist and also um, curator. So Michael, I would like to ask you, so what makes you plan this exhibition into three different chapters and also expand it into like a seven months period? Um, and to Ying, I would like to ask your opinion, like as an independent and also now institutional curator, what is your impression of this um, big project? And um, how do you think of this solo uh, exhibition um, for um, artists who is um, very uh, established at the moment? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think the, the first moment when planning an exhibition cycle like this, you come up with very different ideas. And at one point, you have to decide what you want to explore. And maybe this is the one of the key words which was important for me uh, with this exhibition cycle. It was not so much about presenting uh, the new art production from the studio. It was really in a way playing with the timeline, uh, going backwards, going further into the future and as well focusing on what, what I want generally as an artist to say to my audience. So this was more or less the setting for me for these three shows. And maybe already what is important as a first hint that something uh, is we have three chapters, but it's not chapter one, two, three. We have chapter one, two, four. So mm -hmm. we have a missing chapter. And maybe this, uh, this missing point was already already for me a setting. If you want to talk about yourself, uh, there's always a black stain, which you never can enter. You might get to your subconscious some information to it, but there is two gaps which always exist. It's the one gap which 
always as is, you can't look from outside of on yourself so because you're inside and on the other hand is that as an artist who, who's trying to talk about himself um the distance uh to the object and being the subject who's looking at the object is a very tricky situation and it's maybe a, a quite unusual idea uh, for a setting of an exhibition cycle. Um, should I maybe follow up a question? Because um, yes, you want. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because um, since you're already talking about like you are kind of working for yourself at this show, so I know you're not only taking this role of artist, but also I guess like more has like as a curator as a mm -hmm exhibition planner of the show. So can you share a little bit more of this experience of how you um, plan yourself uh, for the, the whole project? Yeah, I mean, the, it's tricky because you are, I have two professions in, in, in this way with this exhibition cycle. I'm trying or I'm the artist as well. I'm the creator who was not only designing and the setting of it as well, uh, planning as almost I could look from outside on myself, which is uh, an utopian moment. It's as we know, it's impossible to have this view. Uh, but it was in this case quite complicated. I, for me as a curator, it's much easier to work with from other artists instead of working with my own um, works. So normally uh, in a typical uh, um, solo exhibition, you have a very short uh, moment of, uh, of your production in the sense that the works are mostly very time-wise, very close to each other. Here we have a huge span. I, I think the oldest work is uh, almost 15, uh, 18, 20 years ago and on the other hand, you would say it's almost like a monographic um, retrospective, but it's not. So all the usual um, yeah, formats of exhibitions, um, I'm as well playing with it. And, um, and I'm, tr I'm trying to uh, break the rules which exist with, with the similar formats which exist. I found it really interesting that you were presenting it um, as three, like a self-exploration exercise. I keep feel like exercise is more a wide word rather than three solo exhibitions. Um, like you say, actually, when you plan for an exhibition, whether it is for yourself or for someone else, um, you trying to explore something which sometimes we call it a theme, sometimes we call it a subject matter. Right. And it seems to me that you actually have very clear um, outcome or certain question that you were trying to find an answer through going through all this exercise to yourself. That is repeated in every beginning, the introduction of the exhibition. That's about a self-discovery, embracing the change, and self-formation. And I might leave it a little bit later to see how, how far or how much you achieve of that three very specific aspects you set for yourself to achieve after you've done this settlement um, or art creation. But something I find it quite interesting, because you are self-curating um, this process. So going through your work, um, I realized that um, it is quite rational or everything was planted in a way though, even though every single one have different logic, but they were more tend to be a rational planning than an intrinsic and um, production. I wonder, is it because there is a lack of someone as an objective observator, like a curator role, that's why I see it more in this way, or actually there was quite a lot of intrinsic touch that I wasn't able to see, if you can point me onto this. 
normally when I'm setting up a, an exhibition, I'm, I'm mostly, uh, first of all, thinking about what I would call the temperature or the, um, the atmosphere of it. So because, um, and mostly you have a, as a first layer, um, this idea to bring the temperature of the exhibition close to the idea of um, the content. So you, what you do, you want to level these layers and become as much as possible identical. But um, here the content as being me cannot uh, be displayed in the same way. First of all, there is not the idea of that you can paint the full image of the person. So for me, it was very st strange to see, uh, specifically when I went back to uh, of the older works which were in the exhibition, they felt almost like they were done by a stranger, a person I can't even uh, enter now, even uh, it should be the same person, but this person is not existing anymore. So in, in this way, it was helpful uh, to work with as well as a starting point with older works because there was a, a lot of more distance and it was much easier uh, uh, for the curatorial process than the the last show the last show is very much very close to the um, temporary uh, production of my studio with very much works which are very typical for the uh, the way i worked right now and then there is it's much easier because you're you're still in it but the huge time gap which existed um was helpful but on the other hand uh, there it was easier for me as a working as a curator but as it came more and more close to the moment where i am uh, it became very difficult i think and uh, the way how you describe um thing about the uh temperature of an exhibition. That's really interesting. Because when I come to curate a show, I always think um, I'm trying to imagine what is the temperature of my exhibition a lot of time. Even the extreme coldness, freezingness, hot or warm, they're all a kind of temperature. And it defined the way how I would communicate or how the audience can um, connect or react to it. Um, I feel like sometimes in your exhibition, there is a lot of logic and symbol that sometimes is lost in translation. So if there is so many different logic or, um, or symbolic meaning in your work, how do you see the connection or the communication with your audience? How important are they? Or, what do you expect from an audience? I feel like your show is quite different. It's not a lot of information. You didn't even give an English title for your work. I almost need to bring a dictionary to your show. So it that mean that communication is not playing a role once your work is out and it is just be there and for people's interpretation? How do you see that? First of all, a very clear answer for an exhibition is it only exists because there's an audience. It doesn't make sense to have an exhibition without the idea of an audience. Mm -hmm. So generally, as a, uh, as a practice, uh, it's not so much uh, what people mostly focus on when they th think about an artist of what they produce. For me, it is more or less that I'm setting up a language which is communicative. And therefore, it, it doesn't make sense to sit in front of a mirror and to talk with yourself, maybe for some reasons, but mostly I would say the reason is I want, because we are generally a social structure who, who wants to communicate in very different layers. So for me, for example, when I was think, uh, talking about temperature, the first one was almost like from the light when you compare the first uh, exhibition and the third you have this almost like a cave a, a very dark uh, situation and giving only with this idea of darkness i wanted to make clear it was quite difficult 
for myself to see what is existing in this dark cave. So, because this was for me an idea of presenting past. So the darkness is something which comes uh, into, the, into the now and produces something which is not as clear as the white last version where everything is very easily to, to see, but there, there is a different um, interruption because of the setting of the works there. You can't even see sometimes clearly to one specific artwork because it's always interrupted by a neighbor or something of another artwork which is in front of it. So you have to, to move. And this is for, for example, the movement I'm trying to set up as a, a tour in the exhibition gives the audience this idea that they make the decisions. So of course, it's not like a book which you open and you have from one point the possibility to see everything. You have to do something by yourself. You have to make a floor plan in your mind. You have to walk through it and you have to find what is connected to what. Uh, may I suggest we move into um, every exhibition chronologically now, because I believe some of our audience have visited um, Dalai Juma in person, but some may not be able to do so during COVID, um, and it could be abstract for uh, some of our audience to, uh, to visually relate to different works and the practice you're mentioning. So um, maybe we can continue this discussion uh, into different chapters now. So yeah, for here, um, we can see um, different installation shots uh, of the three chapters. And uh, talking about the temperature of exhibition, I do feel each exhibition delivers a very different um, temperature. And also the color is very uh, well designed uh, and also um, accurately responding, I think, to uh, the essence of each exhibition. Well, this photo, I mean, this poster, I believe many of us have received um, for um, the exhibition period. And the first chapter, feeling and a structure, feeling and accuracy. It's for me, it's relatively cold and also very sober. Uh, and we know this exhibition um, is a revisit of Michael's um, travel to the Himalayas 30 years ago, where Michael stayed in the, the Lakh region in India, and also I think you stayed uh, in the temple for almost a year. Um, so from our previous um, discussion and also from the many materials uh, you've, read, you've written or um, from the um, the pre press coverage, I've learned about that you had lots of this um, more of like struggles about if you want to pursue Buddhism or either you want to keep pursuing art artistic career at this relatively young age. But looking back to your trip at this moment, I'd like to ask you, so what is this ultimate discoveries or what is this ultimate answer you found in this trip 30 years ago? And what makes you the artist today you are today? Mm, I mean, the, the major question is about how you deal with your ego. Um, and specifically, uh, one idea we have maybe share is that an artist is sharing this idea of his ego with his audience. And with all... Uh, interferences it has. It's not that uh, this communication is only uh, telling the truth, it's also pretending. Uh, so there's also a role of an artist. It's not only uh, um, the pure, whatever uh, this would be, the pure human called Michael. It's a lot of layers uh, the ego is set it up in. And one ego is for sure this pressure of finding your original um, art style, art practice, and it's all you in this universe, you are something like the sun. Every 
everything turns around you. Mm-hmm. And uh, this um, egocentric uh, universe you are entering comes up with a lot of questions. I think every artist is asking himself. First of all, why should you be in a way elected and even it's only by yourself that you have something to say in a, to an audience? That's maybe the first question. Uh, what, what do you want to share with someone? And why is there this reason inside yourself that you want to have an audience and to talk to someone? This is very psychological, uh, maybe the, the major thing of the practice. And for me, this extremely strong you or centric, I would say, uh, as an artist view, uh, brought up a lot of troubles for myself. First of all, I thought, I'm not important enough to, to talk about these things. Why should I? I am coming from a very tiny village. Uh, what do I know about the world? Um, and what is so interesting about my world uh, that I should share with a lot of people? So there's a, this utopian moment as which is very powerful and uh, a lot of strengths giving yourself. On the other hand, you have the biggest doubts coming up. So um, why you bringing yourself into the situation and this moment entering um, the Himalayan mountains and therefore as well the Buddhism is a very different concept about the ego. You have to give it up to, to find a way uh, to survive in this world in a, in a way I would call it beautiful. And these two concepts were, I was very much struggling with it. And I remember a, a very important moment. There's, there is not a book like the Bible in the Buddhist. Um, they have the Kanji and the Tanji, but they are comments more or less, not, the, not holy words by a God, but there's a, one major book which is shared by almost all uh, Buddhist um, schools, uh, w- which young monks start to study. And I remember I came to something like page 40, 50, and I was starting to cry because of what I was reading there, I was already clear, I will never fulfill it because my idea of being an artist mm-hmm. is not comparable and shareable to this idea which is written in the sentences I was reading at that moment. And I had really make a very strong decision for my life, which path you want to follow. And so this is more or less all kind of a remembrance from these days as well. As well, you see with the title there, very precise. You have even the, the places where I really was standing at this moment. So um, that made it clear for maybe for the audience that all of these moments you see in the exhibition, I was at these places, um, not only remembering or trying to um, have an image of this place, I was really there on one level. On the other level, I, I thought I would be never there. And I think this is um, as well why it got so dark, this exhibition, um, because I couldn't open it in the end for myself. Um, I also noticed because those, uh, especially the series of paintings is actually made in this recent uh, one to two years. Um, so are those more like your um, impression or your uh, memory or even the dreams of these locations you have been actually there many years ago? For me, an interesting is where is an image set it up? Um, and it's, um, I have sometimes even, when we, when, when we would talk about very different paintings of me, is that the image already exists. It's more or less that I am trying to discover something which is inside. And um, it's so our brain is so much overlaid by different images. And it's what you do in the end, you try to, to get rid of a lot of the image to focus on something. So this, in a way, it's a, a very active practice. 
on the other hand, they have something <coughs> which becomes somehow like a memory. Uh, it's very interesting to see when you, and you have the feeling, uh, I remember there's an image where I'm three or four years old and sitting with my aunt there that I, through the image, I have the feeling that I could remember this moment, but it's not true. I can't remember it, but I produce a kind of uh, memory, which is totally artificial because it's co co connected to this image. So that is uh, first where doubts come up. Uh, how can we memorize things and how memory is playing with our mind that we produce an image of a memory, which we really feel that we were there or we can't, could enter again the situation, but it's only uh, something which our brain is playing with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, and then when you have this in mind, um, how much the brain is playing with your uh, conscious and with your ideas, you have to be very careful as well uh, if he, it looks like it could be authentic because I was there, which is a, a more or less like you could say a trust, which comes from reality. But in the end, I would say it's still something which is only produced in my mind. Yes. Uh, In, would you like to respond to um, Michael? Because um, what I'm also curious about is your uh, feeling after seeing this very um, iconic series of um, paintings that is very well, first of all, large in scale, also very expressive, and also it's very um, abstract in a way, but at the same time, it also reminds me of, um, it's very landscape-like at the same time. Yeah, I think what Michael mentioned about the authentic, the memory. Um, actually, when I just look at the work standing in front of the exhibition, um, without looking at any tests or hearing the introduction from Lisa and Kelvin, it is hard to say whether it is something about memory. Is it something created recently or uh, how many years ago? Because I think there are two things. First is like, some of the work is created many, many years ago, and it was created maybe for a different reason. But when it's put together this time, it's a second layer of creativity being applied on this. So everything is created at the moment, at the very reasons. And so this is one thing I find it quite interesting when I look at that. Another thing is about memory how much we can trust our own memory or do we ever doubt our memory? Probably it only come to something that is related to someone else or we have to respond to give an answer or something. Otherwise, memory is something that is not just whether we remember it correctly or not. It is a fluid Mm, it's a situation almost because it can be shaped, changed by the new knowledge, the new perspective that we accumulate onto our personal experiences. And that will have the impact on the memory itself. But if we're going back to the very purposes of the solo exhibition about self-discovery, the process of going through some period's work, looking at the work and having a flashback connected to the very experience that you have many years ago. Does it serve the, does it serve the purpose as a discovery process? Um, I think when we see this, uh, these artifacts and artworks in an exhibition, um, I'm of rearranging it to one situation as one exhibition, as I would say, I'm using these artworks for setting up a narration. So as well, what we do with ourselves is that we are not 
singular and a singular moment, we are always in a setting. And um, so what we produce as well as for the image of our own ego is that we are interactive in a narration. So, the, and I would say that is uh, the, the exercise of the exhibition is setting up the, the narration through these images which exist. Um, because you could bring them in a very different narration and bring it uh, to so an, uh, a story which is totally different to the story I was telling in the first chapter. So um, this uh, setting up of narration is something not only exists for an exhibition, it also exists for, for the ego itself. Mm -hmm. The ego wants to live in a narration. It can't be isolated because it, uh, it's, the major thing is that it's interactive. Uh, shall we move on to some of the artworks in the first chapter? Uh, for example, I'm very interested in this uh, video work, um, the attempt to be abstract under, under uh, hypnosis. So we can, oh, didn't include a video, um, but this is not only um, the, the only work of Michael, which you are playing with uh, subconsciousness, but also with the autonomy of your art practice in the work. Um, I think maybe we can continue this conversation while we reach the last chapter um, that uh, you also continue to explore the uh, synth and topic. Um, similarly, um, there's this two sculptural works in the first chapter. Um, I don't know how to pronounce German, but uh, it's about the bone. Uh, and it's about um, the ankle, the, the leg ankle bone uh, we have on human bodies. And this is inspired um, by the sky burial um, tradition that Michael uh, noticed um, many years ago in this um, Tibet trip. And in the last chapter, we're going to um, see more of uh, Michael's doctoral works, and we're going to talk more by then. So now let's move into the second chapter, the Klaus Severe. So this exhibition has a much warmer temperature compared to the first one. Uh, and the thin color orange also gives us this very quite optimistic feeling, um, but still it has a very dark brown and still gives this feeling of uh, we're all observing something very engineered, especially when the whole wallpaper is in this um, grilled material, which, which is kind of a continuation uh, of the first chapter, which you use the green grades as well. So this drawing work is also a continuation of Michael's exploration of his memory, of his experience in Tibet many years ago. Um, also, um, Michael made more painting works, which is also very expressive. But I would like to focus on this series of works um, with the working title. Would you, okay, can you correct me how to pronounce this work? Wolken Atlas. Yes, Mount so the cloud, yes, severe. Um, so Michael, I would like to ask you what this work about, because it's also kind of the centerpiece uh, of the chapter two exhibition. Um, and uh, there are uh, 81 small works that compose the whole installation on wall. There are drawings of the clouds you observed at different periods of time. There's also like the pictures of the mushroom clouds. Um, it's very poetic also very scientific at the same time. Um, it's also very conflicting to me, but would you like to tell us more about this work? Um, maybe with the title. Um, first of all, um, for starting this, um, I invented a kind of a Tobian person which exists in my mind. And this person is, I would say he's an idiot. Uh, and what makes clear that he's an idiot in a very positive way is that he, he wants to measure something which, which is unmeasurable. So already the setting is, uh, and what would be the sense of knowing 
how big a cloud is or how deep a cloud is. Uh, what is the interesting of this information? So he, this person is uh, doing something in his life which is quite useless in the sense of, um, we would say productive, commercially, politically, socially. He is observing something with, we don't know what use he will have through his observation. So this is the main thing I invented. And what you see in this era, um, in these plates, are different clouds from different point of views and of very different ideas uh, where clouds are happening. And they are not only uh, in our atmosphere, as well we human being through an atomic bomb can produce a pressure and clouds. So it's something which is outside and as well something uh, which is produced by humans. So first of all, only to give you these two different clouds is how big uh, the world is he's observing. And that when you want to observe this total world, you are even more useless in it because you, you are only through the only the, the point of view where you're standing, you have a, a very small part of the world you can look at. So, but this guy wants not only to look at the world, he wants to very precisely measure it out. So this kind of positive idiot is in a way asking what is, is making sense for humans. And that's maybe the cloud as a symbol is used in this um, work is something which we produce, observe, and is changing all the time. So when I remember me as a child, I would answer the question, what is, makes sense for me would be very different to the moment I would answer that today. Um, well, we have a question from the audience. I think it's related to this uh, series of work. So why do you like to paint or say draw behind the glasses or you like to frame those works uh, in acrylic boxes? Uh, the framing is something like uh, making the decision. So um, you, you have the decision of a format. So that's something which gives you the stage where the information is set at. And um, to make clear here, what I do is the grid is expanding in the whole space, but a few is always on one uh, moment. And the, the setting of the class boxes is more or less like the focus on what you're observing right now. And what you see is uh, the grid is not only on, in the back, it's also entering the uh, the artifacts and uh, images themselves and what you see with them when you look right now on the orange major lines of the grid that they start to dance and this is happening because of our um, observation we are standing in, in this case in the middle and there we have no idea of deepness or space but if your eyes go to the left or to the right you see that the, the line is interrupted. Uh, this is not because the line is interrupted. The line is still on uh, covering each other, but through our uh, point of view, they give us the image if the line would be broken. So this idea of um, something uh, we are observing is interrupted only because of the point of view where we are standing. So what you have to do as the audience, if you want to have the lines of the grid together again, uninterrupted, you have to move. Mm -hmm. So that is very, so there is no point of view where you can see all in the same way. You have, if you want to have this information, you, you really physically as the observer have to move in front of the, the work. So there is no, central point of it so that is maybe the, the the of the work itself as a structure that the audience is producing the image well can i follow up the question which is is this ivy's here kind of play the role of observer or play the role of um the surveyor that 
well, it's, it stops at the moment, but could be, um, you know, move around? Uh, first of all, it may, may be important to know that the, the specific uh, bird, which I'm using, the ibis, is used in Egypt uh, culture as the god or as a symbol for the god for knowledge and for script. So two ways of, um, uh, first of all, storing information through scripture of writing. So that is as well this idea of that we want to bring us into a narration because we want to say it to someone and as well, uh, he is observing uh, the work itself as, as one observer. I see. Um, and maybe uh, to in, because um, I think for us like curators, it's always important to think about the questions of how the art, artists will be seen in their exhibition and how the artworks will be seen. So I'm curious about your take, um, either the ivies or um, like, what do you think of um, Michael's choice of placing the ivies here or the overall idea of um, the, um, the calling to be seen for the whole show? I remember when I visited this exhibition and the first thing come to my mind is that it feels like a lot of fragment of information. And the fragment of information, even though visually it looked like you have a given logic, but actually that, that given logic it is a direction, but not an intrusion. It's a direction, a hinge on they have a relationship, they have established a kind of connection, but it is not clear that how we can work out or if we're going along this, what can we find out from this? So I think the fragmentation on that pieces of work is very interesting. And obviously it helped in terms of organizing different fragments into a bigger unit. And the iris in this positioning, particularly if you see in the space, because a lot of time, if we see as a sculpture, there is not enough spaces really for me to move around 360 degree. Um, also the face or the front is actually facing the wall, which is harder for me to look at it. So it's obviously being there as a pointing finger rather than a sculpture on its own. It's the messenger rather than um, self-sustained um, as a piece of artwork. So this is how I approach this work when I first come to see this show. But next after I trying to figure out a way for myself to connect or to see it, I actually come up immediately with another question. Um, so basically, I see Michael never be restricted by the art form. He worked with every single form I can think of, and even has novel, which I just find out today. So um, if cloud is such a fluid concept, why it doesn't reflect on the art form that you choose? Mm. As an artist, you... You, you bring up uh, signs of which say stop. And stop means um, that you, you have to focus, you have, you have to make decisions. Uh, that is maybe the, the major practice of an artist to make the decisions. And for me, uh, exactly as well, is to give a transparency in a, in why I make the decisions. And um, so I like in the, I, one way to give you as a key in, uh, to the audience um, saying, that's what I said. But at the same time, you have to produce the sense in the end, not me, uh, because the sense I'm producing to this specific work might be very different to the sense the audience or one of the uh, observer is producing. And I want to make very clear and then this, that this process um, of what makes sense 
is produced always when we look at things. And um, I don't want to uh, tell that this sense makes more sense than your sense or the other way around. I only want to make a give it a transparency in the exhibition that we know about this um, as, as, as well. It's a kind of a power structure which exists between who's setting up the, the sense. But I, I honestly believe uh, in it that as a human, we have to give this freedom that everyone is in the end producing it by himself. So that is a, a bit of, as well, I like this idea of an idiot. Uh, the idiot is for me a person who is clear for himself, but he is not clear by people who surround him. I think it's a good time to address a question from Anne-Marie uh, Anne from uh, our audience. Uh, Michael and Ian, you can also open up the chat box. So Anne is asking, but the concept goes back to the concept of the artist has also artistic connections, uh, um, connotations. So the idiot has also humor irony. Is the double bind behind uh, between the scientific proof of documentation in the outlets and also the immateriality, uh, ephemerality, a metaphor for the artist's way to approach things? There are some, uh, now we're going very into details in this work, but there are some of the plates, are, uh, there are a lot of num uh, numbers given. Some of them are totally uh, logical. So um, you directly see as, for example, one, two, three, four, five. It's a, a very simple rule everyone can to follow and gets directly the information of logic behind. But there are as well other plates of numbers where these are much more complex. So you need a kind of knowledge to understand what is given in the row. And there are some uh, of the plates with numbers who have no rules at all. So um, first of all, we need knowledge to understand what we see. Uh, that is maybe uh, we often forget. And even in our huge, small world, um, the knowledge which exists is as well specific. It doesn't mean that knowledge uh, is really like, uh, we, we think uh, like a, a, a data which, which can travel in the world, but the, the, the knowledge and the data will always differently be read. And that is the, the reason because we are humans who have different accesses and we have different knowledges of reading things. Um, therefore, we can, we can be very precise, specifically when we talk like a language of math, um, which has this uh, utopian moment that it can be understandable everywhere in the world. But we are not talking about these simple things like uh, roles of a number. We are talking about complicated things of uh, what makes sense, which is as well culturally, political set it. I, for me, it was clear, you have to open as much as possible because I don't want to have the power over someone. I only want to say, in the end, it's a, a portrait of humankind less than a portrait of me. Uh, shall we then move into the third chapter, which is, well, for, uh, the fourth chapter, which is also the last chapter, which is very much about uh, the idea of me. So chapter four, self-creation. I think I can address this question from our audience as well, from Vanessa. So when I said, I have been intrigued by the notion of body in Michael's work since my first visit to his studio in Berlin, I'd like to ask what is body to Michael? Because I observed the notion of body spread a quite extensive spectrum in terms of objectivity and subjectivity in his works. The laborious, long durée, laboriously erasing, etc. Maybe you can go backwards uh, to the uh, to the image where we see the yeah this one where we no one back again 
to the, yes, this one. Uh, you see this pornographic image uh, in there where someone is um, uh, masturbating himself or kissing uh, himself. First of all, you, you, you would think, okay, the, this image is about sexuality. Uh, for me, it has a very different idea why it's in the show. It's not so much about the body. It's about uh, a sense of uh, electric shortcut, you could say, um, that object and subject are interacting uh, in one. So the question is how much uh, um, distances I can produce to something uh, when I want to talk about my ego about my eye. Um, and there I made very clear that there is no distance. Uh, so it's, in this case, the image uh, looks pornographic and it's clearly a pornographic moment, but it's used to tell a, a moment of uh, the distances we can set up to something. So I'm using this image and that is maybe as very often I'm producing my art practice, images which are first seen differently and you only through the exhibition uh, setting you can retry to read this image and bring it to a different layer of uh, uh, content. The other one uh, with the, my hands, it's very, uh, with the video work makes us as well very clear of this idea of the two hands. Uh, one, it's not uh, performing, or we can see the video while I talk. Um, so I use my hands and one hand is almost like in a passive mode, almost it doesn't belong to me. And the, the other hand is in this case forming uh, the, the object and then after a while when it frozes into a specific form I close the, the form again and do the different setting that the one which was first passive and was the object now forms uh, the other hand so this interactive of these two hands is a play of how we we self form ourselves and um, when we go back to the work Tageswerk, um, you have the negative imprint. Uh, you can ask, are these objects really um, sculptures in the way? Or for me, most important of this work is that they are not uh, meant as sculptures you look at. You really should take them in the hands and redo because it's almost like a negative space which was existing in my hands doing a specific gesture with it. So if you, it was for me this idea, almost like I would handshakes with my audience with it. So to get as close as possible to, so my, in, in this way, the body is another way to interact with each other. And uh, these sculptures, are in this case less sculptures than that they are a gesture. Yeah, I want to invite in into the conversation as well, because I know you're also very interested in the series of works. Um, and also you also mentioned you like picked one of the sculptures up and to try to image it. Um, the hand of Michael, is that right? Yeah, I when I came to this episode, um, I feel like quite a strong existence or presence. I think every single word and in the show, we're trying to present a state of presence in different way. And particularly that pieces of work that we can actually touch, build it. And it's not just about the touching, it's what we will start to imagine or make connection after we hold it on his hand. So I think that interactiveness was quite a interesting connection or establishment between the audience and the artist. Um, I remember Michael also mentioned like artist present as a is a is a presence and it's an object between artists and also the audiences. And I think that is definitely doing that very function in this work. And also in this show, there is another pieces of work that invite audience to interact or react to it. 
And the other one is actually, I feel like a lot more abstract in a way. And because the setup of the show, a lot of references to existence and present that actually they complement each other in an interesting way. Um, yeah, also uh, to me, because um, we also missed the, uh, the third chapter, um, which to me is kind of uh, like Michael should be here in Hong Kong uh, and activating the sculptures, other works, uh, and the performance is missing, which is kind of the very active um, third chapter that should be. So also this work kind of presents your presence in Hong Kong, even you're thousands of miles away from us. Um, I think it's good time to address another question from the audience that, um, Um, let me pull it up. So as we can tell from this, um, the third, the last chapter, it also gives a very different um, temperature compared to the previous ones. So from Kurt, he is asking, just think the strategy of the first and second phases of exhibition that are very different from the last one. The former were a bit emotionally detached. The last one carries much more warmth. So did Michael deliberately do that and why? Uh, first of all, we have maybe by the design of the uh, exhibition, we have the idea of the white cube. And uh, so the white cube as well, like the white canvas you're standing in front, which has the potential uh, to take almost everything. That is the Otobian idea of our white, uh, um, white cube space we ha have produced, which is not a very old concept. Um, it's still a very young concept, this white space. And truly it has this potential. On the other hand, it's only an Otobian moment um, because it always has to uh, have reality and reality means architecture. There is always a setting existing. So this utopian moment uh, I was playing with is as well, when you transfer this to the idea of ego is that are we kind of bold where we can put in content uh, which becomes uh, ourself and how big can this uh, uh, bowl be and how, what can it uh, contain and so this was the the idea and i didn't want to have a um a specific atmosphere i wanted to have an atmosphere which is as well with the two brackets you see it now in the image we can fill in into this practice a lot of different things and we, we can fill as well nothing in it so the as you see with the image uh, the which is a bit like our um a whole uh, cycle with these three panels uh, on the left side we have as well a missing part and for me it's uh, one information very important is of an ex exhibition and as well of an artwork that we make clear that it's never total there's always something which is not uh, uh, mentioned but exists so this emptiness is as well uh, for me an important information that you have to imaginize by yourself and that is maybe really like an idea of really activating the the observer to fill in this bracket his content and um the, the temperature of the yellow is in one way maybe connected to sun, but this is a very extreme yellow, which is almost like a poison. So or we use this yellow very often uh, to uh, um, show attention or you have to take care of something uh, or be careful on it. So as well, we have this color uh, sample black and yellow, which is used for nuclear uh, 
poisoning. So it was very clear as well to, to give an uh, information on it that you shouldn't trust too much an artist uh, as well, specifically when he talks about himself. Mm -hmm. um, I have a related question from our audience. Uh, it is also to Michael. The idea of using the same gallery space for different time frame to house three solo exhibitions is is very interesting attempt, especially mm. under the time of an unexpected travel restriction. Is it challenging to witness all physically, um, as I am experiencing all in virtually now? Is this what you intended, and is related to the missing chapter? The missing chapter was very clear. Uh, already from the beginning. And I mean, that is very nice of something. Uh, I didn't know at that time that I wouldn't be able to travel to these exhibitions and um, that our world has so extremely changed in the last two years. No one thought when I was uh, doing the concepts of this exhibition. So it was very clear for me that I would be there, that I see my own exhibitions only uh, through digital data now nowadays uh, is very surprising for me. Um, this questioning of um, how much we really um, had in already fixed in the beginning, it was a very uh, liquid process. First of all, I think uh, I must say a big thanks to the gallery because the it's a very unusual gesture by a commercial space presenting something which is so uncommercially um, that is very, um, I have to say, a big thanks to the team of Galerie du Mont for that, to give me an invitation for uh, to show a very unusual project. And you would normally say a, a kind of invitation like this comes from an institution but not from a commercial space that is very unusual and for me as well it was very unusual because it was very different types of uh, exhibitions and not used to settle up in places like this um, on the other hand the yellow was very clear i felt quite lonesome with these exhibitions uh, i don't know where that where this emotion comes from, uh, it, I think it's not only this idea that I never entered physically than by myself. I think it was a, a very lonesome exercise to talk with. And normally uh, what we do today would be the, for me, the most human practice standing in, inside the exhibition and talk with the audience. And I'm not more, mo so often interested to be so close to an audience like with this exhibition, um, which is for me as really unusual. Normally, I almost like to hide and not being there. But there, uh, in this case, I really feel a presence which is set it up by not being there. We have many good questions today. Um, so just now we have a question from Elizabeth about um, tax work. Um, this presentation was fascinating, giving an impression like an ossuary or museum of natural history, gesture solidified and shadowed, somehow especially um, ignored during this time of distance and remoteness. Has this meaning of it for you changed over time? Yeah, I like this uh, question because um, uh, the, the characters of the artworks in the exhibition are very different. So uh, specifically the one we see right now, even if it's very personal, maybe we don't have this need when we see this to know very much about the person because the presence of the, the artifact is so different and very clear what you can do with them that um, in a way I'm much more out from this and it almost could be 
only collected by me that I was uh, somewhere outside and found these uh, sculptures or artifacts. Uh, then you have really um, sculptures like the ibis, which is more like uh, Ying was very much made clear. It's like a finger point. So there it's an, a sign for something. So I'm using very different um, char uh, characters and um, practices of artworks. So not every artwork has the same approach or how we can enter it. So each of them are asking for a very specific way to be used. Um, more question about do it yourself. So to Michael, um, in do it yourself, you feature a repetitive action of touching your own hands. In terms of visuals, it conveys a sense of phenomenal, phenomenological approach, just as many interpretations on Duchamp's ready-made. Do you work on the specific philosophical framework when creating your work? Uh, yes. Uh, and I, an artwork, how does it come alive, I would ask. Is, um, for a long, long time, there are only thoughts or smaller images, but not really clear what will happen with it. But does it become a painting? Does it become a sculpture or, or even only a text? I don't know it either in the beginning. And normally the process of my art practice is that they are somehow turning in my mind for several years. And at one point they become clearer and then the artwork itself are asking for a concept, asking for a specific presence. Uh, um, they can be alive and can be communicative with the audience. And um, so the first, I, I would say I have the same com com communication first with these ideas. Uh, and then when I have the, when this talk was as established, a kind of form is coming up. And this form can then find its media uh, it's produced. And I'm trying when very different uh, art practice and concept. There are a lot of things often I'm, I'm told I'm a, a concept artist. I'm quite mistrusting this idea of what a concept artist is. It's not everything where you have to th think about has clearly to mean that it's concept art. I think um, that is a very misusing of this idea of um, what is a conceptual artist. I wouldn't name me like this. I think it's an observing from outside as a sign to me, um, but it's one practice I'm using, but not a general practice. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I think we have limited time, so we're going to save the un unanswered questions uh, towards Q&A. Um, but before we end the conversation, I have a question for Ying. So in this uh, installation photo, we can see um, we have three different um, images. We have two paintings by Michael and another print. So this is a very clear uh, homage to um, Gustav Courbet's uh, famous painting, The Origin of the World. Um, and next to it, uh, the photographic print um, has two parts. One has a man in boxer, but with high heels. Another one is um, the lack of uh, Michael, uh, but in sneakers. So I would like to ask Ying, like, when you see this kind of um, um, this representation of uh, ego, which Michael has already shared with us at the very beginning, and also this um, connection to art history, like what is your take on this and how would you interpret this um, work? Mm. Um, this actually, I found it part of the very complex system that Michael is creating, which I wish we have more time to talk about it. Because I think what is interesting is that there, Michael has certain 
demand or expectation from the audience. We have to come up with our own route. We have to move. We have to respond when it is. And also whether we have that kind of background knowledge in arts in particular will help us to entry a certain extent into Michael's world. And that but if we don't have that kind of background, probably it will be very hard for us to establish our own viewing in this. Um, so yeah, this is how I feel like when I come into the exhibition, I am trying to figure out the logic, some symbolic meaning and some of the references. I actually seeing all three episodes of Michael's work and also this one in particular, it reminds me one of the Polish science fiction writer and Sanish Law Lem. And he actually created his own languages and he almost need a dictionary for the new languages or the word that he created. Um, it is so many layers we can go deep in but also if we refuse this to complete this journey and sending on just one pieces of work, I think a lot of time what struck me is the bodily sensual experience that was represented in Michael's work. So this is the way how I always try to um, use this logic when I see Michael's work, because I feel like some of the words you can just say as the beauty and enjoy it with your own eye and leave. But with some artist's work, you do need a little bit more hints or openness to be able to go in. I must say, uh, maybe a last, because <laughs> this image is freezing now into my mind, uh, or in my view right now. Um, when I was first shown this, uh, self-portrait um, the first thing is very different to the original by Gustav Kobe is uh, that you don't see the face of the woman you mm -hmm. see only her body and uh, I think what it was for me very much important it's not so much interesting to have this view uh, as a from a secret point of view that you can observe and not being observed at the same time. For me, and most important was uh, that I really look at the at the person at that moment when he looks at me. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting when I was showing this work the first time. Uh, my mother was at the opening, and she tried the whole evening to stand in front of this work to cover it. That the, this image is not becoming into the world and i was very much surprised even my father was there and and because of the sexual transmission which is shown in the image uh, my father had really clear questions like oh has his son some dreams of being becoming a woman and but even as a very conservative man he made one very simple answer to it and said whatever you want to say is what you have to say. And this was his opinion on this work. My mother instead, who is, I had the idea much more open. She really, in the end, she would love to cover it with her whole body that no, nothing is seen by it. And I found it very interesting to see how my both parents very differently acted to this image. And it was not possible for them at all to look at what was in my mind with this work. So, and for me, this is maybe a, a thing which is very important, what an audience has to ask itself all the time, what do they want to see? So this question of, uh, is this only a moment of uh, enjoyable uh, to have a, a nice moment with, for example, with beautiness, or do you want to, um, go to a moment of um, reorganizing what you think about the world. And um, that is maybe for me more interesting is what of package every observer has in his own uh, for reading something. And um, through very um, 
yeah, strong images, you can give up a setting where, where it becomes for the audience very difficult uh, to step in to the information I first want to set. So I'm playing as well with the information I'm giving as, as, a, as a test for the audience what mm -hmm. they want. Because that is maybe as well, we always ask what the artist was thinking about. I think it's very much interesting as well to ask the question what the audience wanted from it. This is also something I really cherish about Michael's work is you're constantly experimenting with your practice, not only how you make it, but how people will uh, receive it. And you're always trying to um, try things that um, also challenge people's feelings and people's uh, like norms or notions because many of the questions you have asked in your shows um, are something I have encountered personally when I was like practicing artists many years ago in back in art school it's all the all the similar um, questions or challenges um, or questions to the life to world that I have asked myself so since we have already over time, let's open um, the floor to our audience. If there is questions that's not really answered, feel free to just unmute yourself um, or our staff at Gallery Duma will help you to unmute yourself and you can talk to uh, Michael or Ian directly. And see, I think there are some questions in the chat room. Perhaps we could address those. Sure. Uh, I think there is a question about your painting work. Um, let me see. Yes, uh, from Lu Song. Um, so Michael, do the brush strokes on your paintings stand for something or do you consider them as a pure abstract expressionism? Um, honestly, uh, there you have this idea because these, let's say we go back to the first exhibition where we saw the black strokes, uh, which have a kind of calligraphic um, style. Um, they are, have this idea of gesture in it, but they were purely um, organized in a very disciplined way. So um, what I did, and you often when you practice uh, writing, you as a child, you, I, I wrote this in the in the air for several times. So uh, it's almost like you. I was trying to find the movement um, in the air before it really physically were touching the canvas. So in a way it has this moment of very fast moment, but uh, generally I would say it, it's done very slowly. So not only how things or generally visually uh, interacts with us means that we uh, see it in the way as it has been done, because styles as well have uh, their own readings, which they are delivering. Thank you, Michael. Uh, another question we kind of touched on already, but um, the three chapter solo exhibition, um, this format is very unusual, never seen before like this. So how do you come up with this idea and how does it change your presentation and perspectives and how does Inquok see this as a curator? I mean, there for, for me, again, it's, um, it's a, a very interesting moment, the relationship I have with my gallerist in this case. Um, it's something very unusual and it's very specific that we have a, such a deep conversation all the time and when he came up and uh, invited me for to give me uh, the space not only uh, physically as well in time and uh, asking what do you want to to talk about um 
is something uh, I was invited, but I felt as well a kind of pressure with the to honest to be because um, when you get so much uh, space, you 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 want to fill it in a in a good way. But what is the good way for filling uh, something like this? And so I was as well something which is as well important for an exhibition like this that we had a lot of time together uh, talking about what we're doing and giving me the time um, to be very free with the formats uh, I was presenting. Yeah, I think that is a really interesting and ambitious format. And honestly, I rarely see an artist, any other gallery who will support an artist in this way. Definitely very brave for a gallery to mourn. Um, I have mentioned in the beginning, I see this is solo exhibition has a very interesting format. It is not a virtual perspective. Um, it's a self-exploration in three chapters that almost sounds like an exercise that Michael created for himself. Um, if I have to look at it in a very rational way to analyze that, it is an interesting or a kind of the artist trying to explore the time spent over so many years because the work was selected. Some of it was over 10 years ago. So it is almost a recreation of a certain moment that will relate to the concept that um, the artist wanting to do to achieve through that exercise is a discovery. And it is an acknowledgement to the change over time and acknowledgement of a fluid situation that an, uh, oneself, not just an artist, always facing from time to time. Well, I think this is the perfect answers to end today's discussion. And uh, well, thank you so much, everybody, for your amazing questions um, today. And thank you so much, Michael and Ying, for your participation. Um, this video will be recorded and be uploaded today by Gower Dumont's uh, social media, so feel free to check back. Um, and uh, the exhibition is still on, so go check the final chapter, chapter four, um, self-creation at Gower Dumont in Hong Kong. It's on view until April the 9th. So thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in today, and good night, and good, good, good day to everybody in Europe as well. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much to you both. It's very, very nice. Um, hope next time we can do something like this, which is a, a very different moment. And uh, say goodbye from Berlin. And I uh, wish you a very nice evening in Asia and hope to see you again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Hopefully, we see the other in person next time. Yes. yes. Goodbye. Bye bye, guys.